In this video, I'm interviewing two of the guys from SVK Crypto, a VC investing firm in the cryptocurrency space. We begin the interview by talking specifically about SVK Crypto, then we move on to some incredibly interesting topics, such as when institutional money may enter the market, We'll talk about the Bitcoin ETF. We'll talk about how fund managers are attempting to manage their portfolios in this hectic market and many other topics. This is an opportunity to hear insights from people who know this market inside and out. Therefore, even if you're not interested in SVK crypto, I believe you'll find this interview very, very useful. There's also time jumps in the description. So if you'd like to jump ahead to any particular question, please feel free to do so. After editing the video, it came out to around about 55 minutes. So I've made the decision to split this video into part one and part two. This is part one. Part two will be released very shortly afterwards. And in fact, based on when you're watching this, part two is probably already out. Open up the description now and you'll see a link to part two. Now let's begin with the interview. I'm joined today by Shane and Charles from SBK Crypto. Thanks so much for joining me, guys. Pleasure to be here. Man. You're welcome to our office. What do you yeah. think of the place? Fantastic little space you guys have got. Thanks, man. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful, Tom, because uh, we've also been uh, big fans of your show mm. uh, and what you're doing on social media. And uh, we have learned a lot from you also. So it's great that we finally connected. And thank you very much for coming to the old East End Shortage SVK Crypto HQ. So it's a pleasure to have you. Oh, you flatter me. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's, let's introduce yourselves to the audience. Do you want to just talk about, kind of discuss your background, what brought you into the blockchain space, and touch on briefly what SVK Crypto is all about? Yeah, I think, why don't you kick off and give a little bit about your background and then I will and then we'll Would we'll love to. Uh, my crypto journey started in 2013 through a friend that was buying Bitcoin and a, it really, for me, opened up a lot of doors. I started buying at that stage, kind of forgot about it until kind of 2015, 2016 where, where our interest kind of picked back up. Um, I've been a, a core part of the team here at SVK Crypto and my role is head of strategic partnerships. So that involves building out the community, finding early stage deals, and um, really, really trying to just embed ourselves into the community and go deeper and deeper and try and add as much value as we can. Actually, Charles does so much more. Apart from running all the strategic partnerships and building out our network and jumping on a plane with me at every time that we can to go to the economy or token 2049 or consensus, Charles also delivers a podcast called 15 Minutes of Crypto Fame, which is an audio podcast. And congratulations, but you've just had a uh, Inc. magazine rate you as one of the <laughs> top podcasts to listen to in the world. So um, you know how difficult it is to create and execute content, but you know Charles does does an amazing job. Daily, man. Daily. Daily, Daily gig. Yeah, I'm so impressed by that. Oh, I release a video like once a week, twice a week. You're doing it every single day without fail. Uh -huh. We've got to, man. We've got to keep people uh, up to speed. Mm -hmm. Well, now we started on it like that. <laughs> you can't just stop. <laughs> Um, my name is Shane Kehoe. I am one of the co-founders of SVK Crypto. Uh, my background before I set up SVK Crypto has always been on the institutional side. Uh, my last major role was at one of the largest hedge funds here in London called Bluecrest Capital Management. They are a big macro fund and at their height they managed about $35 billion dollars. Um, of AUM. My role within that fund was a portfolio manager. So I sat within the equity long short and also their emerging market equity desk. And my strategy was to invest into IPOs, initial public offerings. Mm -hmm. I did that very successfully for over five years and I also became the youngest managing partner in the firm's history. Um, not necessarily because of the school that I went to or who I knew but because I had the ability to spot opportunity and that opportunity I feel I'm spotting again with cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. um, at SVK Crypto, um, I do everything from uh, building out our community with Charles to being involved in the investment process uh, to uh, raising capital um, to making the tea. So you guys are a fund which invests specifically into EOS projects, is that correct? Um, that is partly correct. Um, in, initially, we were, we were running proprietary capital and 
and um, maybe we'll get into how we actually got into it initially. Mm -hmm. um, and we were really not interested in, in taking on any outside capital because when you're managing outside capital, it's a different regulatory framework and um, you are the custodian of other people's capital, so you have a big responsibility. So when we entered into the space, uh, we were more than happy to deploy internal, internal partners' capital. And um, we realized that it wasn't just about deploying capital, it's never been about writing checks, all right? because anybody can do that. Um, we realized that it was about a hunt for knowledge because unlike my uh, LinkedIn today where everybody is a ICO expert, guru, guru professional, um, we really don't view it like that. We really realize that the space is evolving and therefore uh, the hunt for knowledge will continue and this is why it's great that people like yourself, Tom, are creating great content to put out to educate people, but that education is a journey. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to uh, the educational journey, what we started to do, do from day one was to hunt for that knowledge and attend a lot of meetups and then we realized we could actually host our own meetups and then we realized well this isn't just a meetup of people coming once or twice it's actually now building community and people are having discussions and then from that part we went on to well how can we do more and how can we give back more and we started the podcast like, like mm. I've discussed and then that went on to having uh, a telegram channel and that then led on to having our own in-house videographer and as that all grew we realized that it's not just about a fund which we've actually ended up having because of all the community it's about a whole movement and um, at the core of our business right now is a venture capital fund in partnership with block one and that fund is uh, solely focused on EOS IO protocol mm -hmm. and uh, our mandate is very simple it's to go and find and invest into projects which will use the EOS IO protocol so the fund which you've referred to is Cryptagon EOS mm -hmm. and that is in partnership with Block One and the mandate is to invest into very early stage projects which will utilize the EOS IO blockchain but that's the serious part of the business. Mm -hmm. Everything else around is the community and uh, we spend our time balancing and loving both. Okay, so there's a combination between the community and the fund. Talking about the fund, what is it about EOS that convinces you this is potentially a blockchain infrastructure that you want to pursue? Well, I think one of the things that we look at is where do we see the future going? And we see the future being decentralized. We mm -hmm. see big applications or dApps in the space, social media being one of them. And then we look at how would they be built? Would they be, be built on Ethereum, which would have massive lag, it would have the scalability issue, it wouldn't be possible. So then we looked at something like EOS, which is scalable. We recently passed 4,000 transactions per second. We looked to build the future and we found EOS through that kind of vision. And we really believe at SVK Crypto that, that will have the ability to do that on. There is one very interesting project which is currently using the EOS IO protocol. Uh, that project name is EOS Bet, and it's a very simple dice game, like a spinning in a row of a dice. Uh, very primitive. It actually almost reminds me a little bit of um, the old Atari video, which is probably a video game, which is probably well before you two guys' times, which was like an old Pac Man or an old uh, tennis game. But the interesting thing about EOS Bet is that it's a dice game, so it just constantly rolls and rolls and rolls. And it gives people the ability to wager their EOS. And um, what's interesting is that it's totally uh, trustless because all the spins are, are uh, produced onto the blockchain, so you can right. check everything. So it's not like you're betting against the house, but you're betting against them clearly labeled and, and transparency within the game. They have done I think, and this was a few days ago now, so my numbers might be a little bit old, but they have got up to about 206,000 transactions within a 24 hour period. Yeah. Um, when you look at 206,000 transactions within a 24 hour period, it's more combined than all the apps or dApps currently on Ethereum. Yeah. Um, so that's quite amazing that we're starting to see that, that put through level on, on ESIO. And also I believe it's utilizing like less than 1% of the capacity on the blockchain. So. Um, things look really exciting for, for EOS. Mm -hmm. um, we're uh, 
very happy to be partnered with them and we uh, spend all our time analyzing um, projects which will utilize the ESIL protocol because that's our mandate but we really do understand that it's early days as well um, but I think they've got off to a phenomenal start with, with mainnet launch um, on, only within the last the last two months. Yeah, there's, been, there's been yeah, there's been some there's there's been some teething problems, but I think they've been dealt with quite well. So well far. I think with EOS, you know, what's so interesting is because they let the community launch the network, and that was that was like that was really interesting to see how that works. And one of the other I think advantages EOS has is because it's so easy to build upon. You've got WebAssembly, C plus plus, so you have people who weren't really programming in Solidity, creating cool dApps or apps on, on online and web, web apps. Now kind of looking at EOS and kind of trying it out, kind of creating some cool stuff. And I think that's what any protocol needs. It's cool applications that people just want to use and mm -hmm. want to use in their everyday lives. Yeah, in order to build that network effect. Absolutely. So there's an interesting one for you guys. There's EOS, Ethereum, NEO, many different infrastructure projects. And following the ICO market, there's usually 10 launched every day. There's not really a need, and to be honest, next year we're going to find there's a few more thousand. How many do you really see being successful in the future? Is there really a need for more than a handful? I think that there will, there will be, uh, obviously, winners and losers. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, there will be a handful of blockchains which are used. Um, I don't think that there will be thousands and thousands and thousands. No. Um, and certainly, you talked about the ICO market and the utility tokens. Um, and uh, those type of projects. I mean, the failure rate that we're already seeing on that is, is tracking close to 95% and it will probably go all the way to 99.9. Um, but that's business and uh, that's what happens in very early stage technology. Not, not everyone will, will make it, but I think um, in the future there will be several different types of blockchains. I think different blockchains might be used for different types of transactions. So some might be quicker, uh, some might have more transparency, um, so it might be used for its geographical location, depending upon brand, like the guys at NEO, we understand they have a very good following in China. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from the user's aspect though, we, we, we won't really notice the different blockchains. Yeah. I think almost like when you get onto your MacBook Pro or your smartphone or your iPad and you connect to the internet, you don't necessarily look at what Wi-Fi network you're on. And I think that that will just all be coming in the back end. Yeah, and, and to add on to that, so any business, always well, kind of our view here is any business that involves trust, um, you know, we believe in both types of public blockchains, so public protocols, and you've got enterprise level as well, there's, there's many out there. Um, R3, Richard Green, we know really well here, he's the CTO over there. They do an incredible job as well. So we, we really believe that a lot of these businesses that involve trust will be moved on to a blockchain of some sort. What that will be, we, time will tell. But I think for the user experience, they probably won't know that it's incorporating blockchain technology. And I think it will get to the point where it's seamless as the point you just mentioned with the Wi-Fi, where you won't have to log in or you won't have to create an ID. It will be embedded into the infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, let's just take a step back. Um, you, you um, rightly so, Tom have alluded to lots of different blockchains, and blockchains are just operating systems, right? Like it's like it's like going back to the mid '90s and buying a Dell or a gateway computer, and then one day you realize that had uh, Microsoft OS, and your computer will sit there, your PC computer will sit there with its operating system on it. But if there's no programs built on top of it, mm -hmm. like Microsoft Office, and there's nobody using those programs then it's just an operating system. It's a carbon added engine. So um, how does one have usability and adoption? It's when you start to have programs that benefits people's lives that are better than the existing types of programs, apps or dApps that are currently out there. So um, I think it, it won't necessarily be the underlying blockchain, but the ability to attract developers to build cool app steps to sit onto that blockchain which then has public using that because they have to have it right so what will be the first killer dap like when you look back at the internet oh great you've got the internet fantastic i also have a book of encyclopedias so i have a choice of going to look at the encyclopedias to compare to putting into a world online american online aol google mm -hmm. but 
that all changed when someone said, you have this thing called electronic mail. That was the first killer application of the internet, whereby people are like, wow, now I go to the computer that's based in the corner because I can email my friend in Australia and he'll get it. And that was the first you know, watershed moment was electronic mail. So it'd be really interesting to see what the first killer dApp will be to sit on the blockchain whereby everybody has to use it. And it's coming. Mm -hmm. It certainly will be fascinating to see how it plays out. <laughs> now let's talk about the overall market. With the, it's been probably eight, nine months now that we've had a, it's a massive market dip. Does it affect your confidence in the market at all? Or do you view this as a potential fantastic buying opportunity? Oh. I should clarify. You've got the answer already. <laughs> uh, not, not so much the fundamentals, because I think everyone in this office 100% agrees with the blockchain fundamentals, but whether the market, the market outlook in the next year, as an example. Well, I think you've come actually on a perfect day. Markets are down 15 to 20%. Look at, look at the top 10 um, on... Um, um, I want this blood in the streets. Yeah, um, I think I would be I would be very concerned. So let let's look at it from a portfolio construction. If if I had a equal weighting of the top ten cryptos, mm -hmm. and um, one or two of those uh, were down twenty percent and the market was up five, I would be very worried that the fundamentals of that particular token, that particular protocol, there was something fundamentally wrong. Mm -hmm. The market is moving in lockstep. And what I mean by that is that when the market's down 20%, everything's down 20%. Mm -hmm. So it's not an individual case. It's the overall sentiment that's pushing the market up, up and down. Um, I was pretty happy today to see the market down because I'm trying to, trying to uh, get in on a few core positions and, and, and size up. Um, so for me, it's a buying opportunity. Yeah. Um, I uh, am very binary about the whole situation. Um, when you look at the overall market capitalization, which is a barometer for price action down at uh, 200 billion as of today, um, when we go back and look at when we were down at 200 billion, it was probably uh, this time last year, I, I would assume, or maybe June or July of, of, of last year. The price action is only one part of the story. Actually, what we're investing in is the tech mm -hmm. and the development. And within the last 12 months, all I have seen is the tech continue to increase. I've seen more infrastructure. I've seen more ramps in and out. I've seen more talk around institutional products, ETFs. I've seen more talk about regulation. Um, I've seen more talk um, around institutional inflows. I've seen more products built. So there is a big divergence or a dislocation between price action, which has been going down, and the underlying tech, which is going up. And for me... I, I have to agree with... I, I completely agree with you, but I want to play devil's advocate, just, sure. just to be interesting. If you look at the dot-com bubble, yep. 2001, it's roughly 2001 it burst, and yep. the prices were headed down. Yep. You could still make the argument, though, that in 2002, everything was significantly further along in terms of development. So there isn't always a correlation between development and price action. That's, that's very true, and I, and I think... I think you're absolutely correct. And um, if you'd bought at the top of the market um, back at the end of the 90s and, and certainly 2000s, uh, the total market capitalization of technology companies, which was listed on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ uh, in combination was about 6.7 trillion. Yeah. Um, remember, that was only a West Coast phenomenon. It was only a US phenomenon. When you look at where we are in the cryptocurrency markets and that's 200 billion, uh, wow, there's a long way to go. But it's a different time and it's a different focus. By the way, that's not inflation adjusted. I could probably make an argument that I could get that to 15 trillion. Mm -hmm. So that kind of shows just how small crypto and blockchain actually is. I mean, there's less than half a percent of people that are online that hold a digital wallet. So because we surround ourselves in it, we think everybody yeah. knows about it, but we've had a conversation about it today saying that you know the majority of people don't know. Um, I think that uh, the price action is the price action and it will do what it, what it does um, and it's not a short term trade for us, right? So um, the market could have easily come down and it could, could continue to fall from here. Mm. I'm not saying that this is the bottom, I'm just saying that for me it looks like a very interesting entry point because the markets move, move, move so quickly to the downside. Um, I want to see where this market is in 5 or 10 years. So I think there's going to be two outcomes. 
It really is. One, we have made uh, an absolute, total, <laughs> flawed <laughs> error and call this whole market wrong. And in five or ten years' time, it goes to absolute zero and we all have to go and get some real jobs. Or two, we've called it absolutely right. And we were there at the inception of something that's going to change the world. And irrespective of the price action and volatility in between, um, you have invested into projects which will be the new Amazons, the new Facebooks, mm -hmm. uh, the new Googles. And um, I like that legacy. Um, and I like that level of risk and um, I'm prepared to uh, be involved into something that uh, I believe will change the world. But if I'm wrong and we all have to go get day jobs, then I'm wrong. But um, it's been a good time. <laughs> at least we had a lot of fun. Right? And life's too yeah. short not to have fun doing it. And, and kind of add on to your point, like as Shane was saying, the market is sentiment driven. Um, and also you have to remember, this is a retail market at the minute. We haven't really seen institutional capital come in. I mean, we've had a lot of scary statistics that have been that have been thrown around. So I'm not going to quote any, but the, this is a this is a retail driven market at this current point in time. And if you look, as you mentioned, the IPO market that was institutional driven. You had mm -hmm. big big institutions, high net worth family offices in that market. We haven't really seen that capital come in. So when that does, and um, it will come in, it'll be interesting to see what happens if it will still scale to the size that we think. We believe it will, and that's something we're very excited about here. I, I think I'm more, that's absolutely a, a catalyst for, for upside price action, but I'm more interested to see the products that are being built by the, the development community. Oh, of course. Like that, that kind of interests me, right? Like, because I think that's the major disruptor. And I think if there's products, platforms, dApps that make our life easier, better, transparent, uh, disrupts anything from supply chain to financial institutions. I think everything else will happen off the back of that. If you don't have the product, then you don't have anything. So I think I'm more focused on really what's going on on the product side. And um, it still feels like we, we're, we're very much at, at basic level yeah and we want we want and I, I and I made an analogy about playing an old Atari game mm -hmm. you know we want to be sitting there with VR goggles playing you know VR games and everybody over the world but the fact of the matter is we're sitting there on a little Atari ST playing Pac-Man but it has to start there and that was my analogy with regards to the dice game we have to just have basic products which have good user cases which proves the uh, uh, protocols can handle what we're trying to do, but I think for me, I'm yeah, I'm really focused on how the tech, and I think from the tech side, everything will, will come through. Yeah. Same from yeah. There. There's a lot of reasons to think we are incredibly early on in the industry. So going back to your point, you mentioned that institutions haven't really made their way into the market yet. When do you think that will occur? Is it like a matter of time, or are there certain things that need to be built in until that's for that to be possible. Yeah, it's a great point. So we did a really good video a couple of months back on our channel talking about the ICE, the Intercontinental Exchange, and how that was beginning to list the futures market. Mm -hmm. So there are a few things are needed, and one of them would be a custodian, an institutional custodian. We saw Goldman Sachs yesterday announced that they're no longer they're going to have that Bitcoin or crypto or digital assets trading desk. Mm -hmm. But they also announced today they've still got plans for their custody, yeah. which is really interesting, something that needs and is very important, an ETF. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that we will have an ETF. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Mm -hmm. So I really believe in, in those milestones to unlock the institutional capital, the wall of money that's waiting to come into the space. So something yeah. that you, you haven't mentioned is regulation. Um, yeah. In order for, because of my background working at a, at a tier one hedge fund, in order for capital allocation to be placed into any type of new strategy, mm -hmm it has to have some type of regulatory framework around it because the fund, hedge fund, pension fund have raised capital from investors mm -hmm. and they've raised capital from investors based on certain parameters within their investment mandate, which would basically say, we will invest into regulated financial markets. Bitcoin, Ethereum, mm -hmm. ICO market do not have that regulatory yes. structure, so they physically can't take the investor's money and apply it. Mm -hmm. I know they all want it because they see the type of alpha that's generated, but mm -hmm. physically because of what they have, have rules and regulations with, with raising that money, they can't. So that's what, is, what, what needs to happen for that to, for that to change? Because the SEC has spoken about Bitcoin and Ethereum 
in relatively positive lights. Is that enough or just more need to come? No, I, I, I think they actually have to. It's all about facing certain type of counterparties in the market and, and having uh, onboarded by reg, uh, 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 onboarded by counterparties that are regulated, like authorised and regulated by the SEC or the FCA, and um, they are unwilling to authorise this asset class as yet. Um, but it's coming, and I think we started to see some very positive light. The first institutional product that we've kind of seen um, has been numerous different trackers, but also I think it was a, a real positive push by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to have a Bitcoin futures market, mm -hmm. um, albeit that it settles in cash, which is a little bit more challenging, but we're starting to see that. You have to remember that at the start of 2017, January 1, the total combined market capitalization was only 20 billion. That's tiny. I mean, there is funds out there that, that, that have under management five times more than the crypto markets combined, right? By 31st of December, 2017, the market was at 800 billion. That's a 40X return, 40 X return just on the market capitalization that catches a lot of people's attention, yeah. right? And it caught ours, and it caught the institutions. And the institutions are like, "Oh my God, we need to get in." Oh, well, before we do that, we then have to go through this whole policies and procedures, and that's what they're going through. It's unfortunate that the market has gone from eight hundred billion then to two hundred billion. And a lot of that development has been made. A lot of that infrastructure has been made. They've got a little bit more com comfortable about regulatory framework and counterparty risk, but now the market's suppressed. So I think we'll need to see some more positive sentiment, but also some clarity with regards to regulation. That's, that's key. And after the regulation gets sorted out, then it comes on to what Charles has said about the custody, because all these large hedge funds and pension funds need a third party operator mm -hmm. for the external auditor to sign off to say, yes, they have a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin and I've gone on to their ledger, or I've checked with so, the custodian yeah. and it's there. At yeah. this point in time, a lot of funds have been self self custody. So now I say to one investor, yeah, I have a hundred million dollars of Bitcoin on this Trezor. stick called the treasure, but don't yeah. worry, man, it's all cool. It's yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, like an auditor goes, well, I don't know if it's there. So yeah, it's growing pains. It's yeah. really, really growing pains. Yeah. So I kind of view it, and I think you guys have the same opinion. It's almost like three issues. One is regulation. Yes. Another is ease of storing cryptocurrency, yes. so the custody mm. solutions. And the third one is ease of buying yeah. cryptocurrency. So the Bitcoin ETF is a thing which a lot of people talk about potentially solving that third issue. Yes. If, obviously coming from the background you do particularly, you share, if the Bitcoin ETF, let's say it's not approved for three, four, five years, how are institutions going to be able to get into the market in the meantime? Will it even be possible? Yeah, um, okay, so there's been numerous submissions for ETFs, um, and each and every time, um, they're not declining the ETF indefinite, mm -hmm. they're delaying it, yeah. which is great, because the policies with the SEC is that they will give you uh, numerous different points on why it was delayed, So, which is great, because then you can address the points, and then you submit again, and you address the points, and... and that will take a time for the correct type of lawyers uh, and structurals to go through and get that looking correct. So um, that's in process. Mm -hmm. um, there has been some, some ETFs which have been declined outright. Mm -hmm. And there has been some other ETFs like the Winkle Boss Brothers, which have been pioneering the space since 2013. And um, I know that they've got some you know, very credible people behind them and they keep, keep on chipping away. But it's not the only way that you can get exposure to Bitcoin. Um, I do know that several of the large banks were looking at having some type of in, internal synthetic uh, Bitcoin pricing, which okay. is kind of like an ETF, but <laughs> what they'll be able to do, because these financial institutions are wonderful at creating new financial products to sell you, uh, we won't talk about uh, CDOs or CDSs or the collapse of the mortgage market in the US. Um, which was basically all built on um, in internal structuring of products that people somewhat needed and how they rated them all AAA, but in fact, when you actually looked at the composite of the portfolio, they were sub-junk. Yep. So um, my good friends over at all the investment banks are working on ways whereby they can have some type of uh, synthetic product whereby they can offer a buy and a sell to institutional investors and the institutional investors would like that because in, in 
this example, they would face the investment bank. So their counterparty would not be an ETF or would not be a, an exchange in Korea, but it would be a reputable bank. And then the reputable bank would try to offset buyers and sellers, like a, like a bookie. Mm -hmm. And if he couldn't offset buyers and sellers, he might actually go into the market and, and buy or sell Bitcoin. Uh, the financial institutions are working on this, but they're slow to do it because, especially when the market comes down, because they already have existing businesses that are very profitable. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, offering some type of internal ETF or synthetic crypto trade would only be a very small percentage of their PL. So, what we've seen in the space is, is a little bit more on the acquisition front. So, you'll see larger banks buying exchanges or different, different financial institutions that would offer that type of crypto. Uh, a great example is this is Goldman Sachs recently purchasing Circle. Mm -hmm. So, um, they're in there and they're trying to phase, find ways to operate, but yet again, we've got to be patient, it's going to take time. I think when the market was up at 800 billion, there was probably a lot of interest from <laughs> financial institutions. Now that the market's suppressed, it's probably not on people's radar. But guess what? Markets go up and down. That's what makes a market. Yeah. I'm so that's yeah. fascinating. So there's basically a potential alternative for institutions to get into cryptocurrencies without an ETF being approved. How would that potentially affect the overall market? Uh, would, would it push up the prices similar to how an ETF would evolve buying the underlying Bitcoin? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think it's almost like mini ETFs. It's the investment bank seeing two-way flow, buying and selling, mm -hmm. and basically trying to offset one client to another. They've been doing it on market making stocks for, for, for many years. Um, I think it would all depend upon the book at the investment bank. If they've got far more buyers than sellers or sellers than buyers, mm -hmm. they have to offset that risk, right? So. Because if, if, if a client comes in and wants to buy or sell the position, they have to be able to offset that. So I think it could, it could add an additional, additional bit of volatility to the market, but depending on how their book is, they might have to be long Bitcoin or short Bitcoin. So I think it's all positive, but it's done at an investment banking level. And uh, yeah. I think we've got a little bit way to go there. But with the price down where it is now suppressed, they probably have a lot less interest at this point in time, but that can change. That yeah. can change. Well, would it would actually involve buying the underlying Bitcoin in order to have those incentives? You'd have to be hedged. Okay. You would have to be hedged so because, that well, uh, let's give an example. We'll say that you had uh, 10 clients come on and all 10 clients wanted to buy 10 Bitcoin, okay? And you sold all those clients 10 Bitcoin. So you had basically sold 100 Bitcoin, okay, yes. at $5,000. Mm -hmm. Fine, okay, it stays at $5,000, you sold a Bitcoin. Now all of a sudden, the price of Bitcoin starts to go up mm -hmm. and up and up, right? And you need to be able to deliver those Bitcoins, right? But you've sold them at a price. Okay. So now you're concerned that the price hasn't gone down, so you bought them lower, but the price is running up. So you yes. have to go into the market and make sure you've got those bitcoins to deliver. Okay, so, so you would effectively have to buy something. Yes, that absolutely. Risk. You would have you, you you couldn't you couldn't have naked exposure in the market. You would have to have the underlying in case they got called in. Okay, so a lot of people at the moment are kind of talking about the Bitcoin ETF as being like the holy grail for cryptos because it allows institutions to enter the market. If I'm getting this right, you're basically saying that institutions have an alternative way, will potentially have an alternative way to invest, and that would involve them buying Bitcoin, so effectively they'd be entering the market anyway. Yeah, but I, I think that what I've, the conversations that I've had with various investment banks, one, they're discussing this, they haven't set it up, two, it will only be for a very finite supply of clients who they already know. Okay. It will have nothing to the size and flow and volume on the ETF, yeah. right? So this is almost like a, this is almost like a smaller internal strategy okay. in order to dip their toe in the water. Water. This is nowhere near the ETF, and I think really, it's not the important part of this point is not just institutional money coming in. The important part of the ETF is that the regulator is willing to sign off on a on a financial product which permits cryptocurrency buying and selling to financial institutions. That's the key, and that's why it's been so important. This is the end of part one of this interview. Remember, the part two will be released very shortly and depending on when you're watching this, it may already be out. So open up the description now and check out there to see if there is a link. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider sharing it with your friends who might like to learn more about the crypto market as well. From Tom here, Crypto Gurus, thank you so much for watching 
and we will speak again very soon.